Welcome to part 11 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. In this series, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, internet mysteries, and more. The Disappearance of Antoinette Cayadito. On April 6, 1986, the disappearance of Antoinette Cayadito a nine-year-old girl from Gallup, New Mexico, sent shockwaves through her community and beyond. Born on December 25, 1976, Antoinette, described by everyone who knew her as a smart, happy child, vanished from her family's home under mysterious circumstances. On the night of April 5, 1986, Penny Cayadito had been out with her friends at a bar while her three daughters, including Antoinette, were at home with a babysitter. Penny arrived home around midnight and sent the babysitter home. It isn't clear to me from my research whether anyone specifically checked on Antoinette at this point. On the morning of April 6, 1986, Penny noticed that Antoinette was not in her bed. The police were notified immediately. The case of Antoinette's disappearance is marked by delayed police action, conflicting accounts, and a haunting phone call. Initially, police did not search the Cayadito home until four days after the child went missing. From my research, it's unclear to me why there was such a delay in searching the Cayadito residence. Suspiciously, Penny mentioned an individual named Emmanuel, who had given Antoinette flowers before her disappearance. However, she only did so after being prompted by a family member during the police investigation. Additionally, a man named Roger reported attempting to check on Penny early in the morning on April 6, 1986. According to his account, he knocked on the door and on a window around 3.30 a.m. Roger and Penny had gotten into an argument at the bar and apparently he wanted to check on her. There was no answer when Roger knocked and his account was corroborated by a neighbor. The significance of the Roger incident is unclear. A significant development occurred one year later with a distressing phone call from a girl claiming to be Antoinette, abruptly ended by an adult's shout and a scuffle. Penny believed the caller to be her daughter but did not recognize the adult voice. Five years after the event, Wendy, one of Antoinette's sisters, disclosed witnessing her sister's abduction by two men after responding to a knock at the door, attributing her silence at the time to fear. Penny's account evolved over time, ultimately cryptically admitting to a potential involvement in her daughter's abduction in 1994, suggesting a premeditated plan with Emmanuel. Despite her confession and the FBI's belief in her involvement, Penny was never charged. Her motive for agreeing to this apparent plan is unknown. Further, whether such a plan even existed remains functionally unknown as well. By 1994, Penny was suffering severely from the effects of drug and alcohol addiction, conditions which would claim her life in 1999. Given that she was never charged, despite this apparent confession, it may not be useful to take this confession at face value. Multiple sightings of Antoinette Cayadito were reported after her disappearance, with witnesses in different locations claiming to have seen a girl matching her description. In San Antonio, a witness reported seeing a girl resembling Antoinette with a blonde woman. At a Thriftway gas station in El Paso, Texas, another witness heard a child screams for help from a passing brown truck. Years later, in Carson City, Nevada, a waitress encountered a teenager resembling Antoinette. This teenager appeared to be signaling for help through her actions and left a napkin message pleading for assistance. These reports, however, did not lead to any breaks in the investigation. Both of Antoinette's parents are now deceased, but her sisters still hold out hope that she is alive. The authorities believe that Antoinette is likely deceased, however, the investigation remains active and ongoing almost 40 years later. I've attached an age-progressed image of what Antoinette may look like today. In my view, there's still a faint hope that she's out there. 
Given that this investigation remains open and active, I strongly encourage anyone with any information or evidence related to this case to reach out to the Gallup Police Department. Carla Atkins and Vicki Stout. Shout out to Remy Lebeau 7258 for recommending this case. Remember to leave a comment below if there's a case you think should be featured on this series. On September 17, 1980, in Dover, Tennessee, the lives of two half-sisters, 14-year-old Carla Atkins and 16-year-old Vicki Stout, took a tragic turn. The siblings had embarked on a seemingly ordinary afternoon journey to a local store, but never returned home. Their disappearance sparked a mystery that has lingered for decades, unsolved and haunting. The day started like any other, with Carla and Vicky leaving their residence. Their destination was a nearby store known as The Furnace, where they intended to purchase some items. Witnesses last saw them in conversation with an unidentified man by a blue pickup truck along US 79 West, near their home, sparking theories and questions that remain unanswered. The community was plunged into despair when, on the afternoon of October 5, 1980, two hikers discovered the girls' bodies in a secluded area of the land between the lakes. The investigation revealed the brutal and tragic manner in which their lives were taken. They were both ended by means of a single shotgun blast to the head. Unfortunately, their bodies were too decomposed at the time of discovery to determine if they were subject to indecent acts. As such, if there was DNA evidence due to such an act, it was destroyed. Despite the clarity of their tragic end, the circumstances leading to their deaths, including the exact time, remain uncertain. The investigation has focused extensively upon the unknown man in the blue pickup truck. Descriptions of this individual and his vehicle were widely circulated, but no definitive connections were made, leaving his role in the events, whether as a suspect or a mere witness, an open question. The man has been described as white, 25 to 30 years old, of average build, sporting a suntan and dark brown hair. The pickup truck was described as light blue or sky blue. Unfortunately, it does not appear that the make and model was ever noted. Given his suntan and his vehicle, I would suggest that he may have been a blue collar worker. That said, this evidence is circumstantial at best, as lots of people who are not blue collar workers also own pickup trucks and have suntans, especially given the location. Throughout the years, the case has seen various calls for information, anniversaries marked by vigils, and attempts to keep the memory of Carla and Vicky alive in the hope of finding justice. Family members and the community have faced the agony of unanswered questions clinging to the hope that new evidence or revelations could emerge, shedding light on this dark chapter of Dover's history. Unfortunately, however, it looks as though there have been no new developments in this case over the course of the last 40 plus years. Disappearance of Suzanne Lyle. Big thank you to patron Jeffer Metcalf for this suggestion. The disappearance of Suzanne Lyle on the evening of March 2nd, 1998 remains a haunting mystery that has intrigued investigators and the public for over two decades. Suzanne, a 19-year-old student at the State University of New York at Albany, vanished after getting off a bus at the university campus, following her shift at a nearby mall. Her disappearance triggered a massive investigation, which is still ongoing till this day. Suzanne was last confirmed to have boarded a bus from Crossgates Mall where she worked, with intentions to return to her dormitory. A bus driver and a friend reported seeing her board and exit the bus, respectively, but she never made it back to her room. The following day, when Suzanne failed to contact her boyfriend or return to her dorm, her parents were alerted, marking the beginning of a perplexing case. Despite initial reluctance from campus police to escalate the matter, 
Suzanne's continued absence led to the involvement of the New York State Police. Importantly, the campus police were only willing to investigate once it became clear that Suzanne was missing multiple midterm exams. This, of course, wasted valuable investigative time, as the initial hours and in investigation are key to the timely resolution of such crimes. The investigation into Suzanne's disappearance revealed several puzzling elements. Her bank card was used after her disappearance to withdraw money from an ATM, a transaction that hinted at someone with knowledge of her PIN. This possibly suggested someone close to her was involved. Despite extensive searches and the examination of hundreds of leads, no substantial evidence was uncovered to explain her disappearance. Investigators considered various theories, including the possibility that Suzanne may have been taken against her will. Speculation also arose about her relationship with her boyfriend, who was scrutinized by police but maintained his innocence. Her boyfriend had a confirmed alibi at the time of the disappearance. Despite this, according to the police, he has since refused to cooperate further with the investigation. However, I note that it's important to consider the context of his supposed refusal to cooperate with police. The boyfriend refused to be subjected to a polygraph test and would only agree to questioning with a lawyer present. In my view, I don't necessarily think that the boyfriend's requests ought to place any suspicion on him, given that he had provided a firm alibi, which was verified by the police. If the police had not confirmed his alibi with certainty, this situation would look much more suspicious. Given the high-profile nature of Suzanne's disappearance, numerous theories have surfaced to explain her disappearance. Investigators looked into Karen Louise Wilson's disappearance, a State University of New York Albany student missing since March 27, 1985, for potential links to Suzanne Lyle's case. Investigators found similarities between the cases, but no concrete evidence of any connection. Also, stay tuned, because Karen Louise Wilson's case will be discussed later in the video. Another theory revolves around the potential that Suzanne had a stalker. A co-worker reported Suzanne felt she was being stalked about a month before her disappearance, but Suzanne seemed unworried by this individual. According to this theory, the stalker is connected to her disappearance. However, there is no evidence whatsoever to support this explanation. In 2018, John Camp, a senior investigator speaking on behalf of the New York State Police, publicly indicated their quote-unquote belief is that she was a victim of homicide. I note that the wording of the statement indicates no concrete evidence whatsoever to indicate a homicide occurred but rather a professional opinion based on cases such as this. Notably, in this same statement, John Camp enigmatically indicated that there's a possibility that she moved away. On a positive note, Suzanne's parents were not only extremely active in seeking answers in their daughter's case, they also made substantial progress towards improving the safety of individuals in a similar situation as Suzanne thus likely saving untold lives. Following their daughter's disappearance, they successfully pushed for legislative changes in New York to improve campus safety, resulting in Suzanne's Law. This law mandates detailed plans for investigating crimes on campuses and swift reporting of missing persons cases. As you will recall, the campus police were extremely dismissive of Suzanne's disappearance. However, they didn't stop there. Their advocacy led to a federal change in 2003, which included a provision to increase the age limit for reporting missing persons to the National Crime Information Center to 21. This case is still being actively investigated by the New York State Police. If you have any evidence regarding the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle, please reach out to New York State Police. Hey everyone, Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a huge favor and hit like and subscribe and that sweet, sweet notification bell. 
My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. The links to all three are in the description of this video. The Bora Boraton, the possessed sleeping mat. The Bora Boraton is a unique and intriguing creature from Japanese folklore, known as a Tsukumogami yokai. This term refers to objects that have acquired a spirit after reaching a significant age, usually 100 years, turning them into living entities with supernatural powers. The Bora Boraton, in particular, is a tattered sleeping mat that has come to life, embodying the essence of something once mundane, now endowed with eerie capabilities. Appearing primarily at night, the Bora Boraton is not just any old mat. It rises into the air, defying gravity with its ability to levitate. What makes the Bora Boraton especially notable is its association with emotions such as extreme loneliness and desolation, suggesting a deeper narrative behind its existence. These feelings are thought to animate the Bora Boraton, giving it a longing for human touch and interaction, which, according to legends, can lead to fatal encounters for those who come into contact with it. The Bora Boraton does not always intend to engage in a fatal interaction with its victim. Rather, some of them just long for the days when they were cuddled, leading to a sort of quote-unquote hug of death. The origins of the Bora Boraton can be traced back to traditional Japanese beliefs regarding objects and their potential to acquire life and spirit. This yokai is an excellent example of Tsukumogami, illustrating the animistic aspect of Japanese religion, where even the most ordinary items can become entities with their own desires and intentions. For reference, if you've watched the previous parts in this series, you'll recall that swords are thought to have good or evil spirits, with the Muramasa being examples of evil blades. Conversely, the Masamune are examples of righteous swords with good spirits. Powers associated with the Bora Boraton include not only its unnerving levitation, but also its ability to induce mental sedation. This makes its victims feel an overwhelming sense of comfort and sleepiness rendering them vulnerable to its embrace. Yokai like the Bora Boraton are still widely believed to exist in Japan. I was able to find a poll from 2013 indicating 57.4% of individuals aged 20 to 59 possess some beliefs in supernatural entities such as ghosts or yokai. That said, in terms of specific belief in the Bora Boraton, I've had less luck finding sources. In my view, the tale of the Bora Boraton can be interpreted, at the very least, as a warning of the consequences of neglecting and disregarding what once provided comfort, rest, and warmth. However, I believe there may be more to this deceptively simple tale. Japanese civilization has been influenced throughout by Confucian thought. As you may or may not be aware, taking care of one's parents as they age is perhaps the strongest duty one has in the Confucian social order. I hypothesize that the Bora Boraton thus may serve as an allegory for the importance of caring for one's parents as they age. If the sleeping mat, once a source of comfort and rest, is taken care of and treated properly, it never transforms into a Bora Boraton. In this allegory, the Bora Boraton's actions, while malevolent, are a call for recognition and acknowledgement of the elderly's needs, desires, and the respect they deserve. That said, sometimes an old sleeping mat is just an old sleeping mat. Let me know what you think of this theory on this fascinating entity in the comments. Pitt's Lake Lost Gold Mine the legend of Pitt Lake's lost gold mine has captivated the imagination of treasure hunters and adventure seekers for over a century. Nestled in the rugged wilderness of British Columbia, Canada, this gold mine allegedly offers great fortune for the bold. 
At the heart of the legend is the story of a prospector named Wilbur Armstrong, who, in the early 1900s, embarked on expeditions to find the legendary treasure within 20 miles of the head of Pitt Lake. Accounts from that era tell of another prospector, Walter Jackson, also known as Walter Shotwell in some versions of the story, who purportedly discovered a valley where the bedrock was visibly rich with gold. Before his death, Jackson sent a letter detailing the location of his find, describing a cache of gold buried under a tent-shaped rock overseen by three mountain peaks. This narrative, while fascinating, is clouded by the absence of concrete evidence and the varying names and details that emerge in different retellings. The enigmatic Slumac, a Katsi First Nation man, is another pivotal figure in this saga. Convicted for a slaying in the late 19th century, Slumac is rumored to have discovered a rich gold mine whose location died with him. His story has been embellished over time, transforming him into a character shrouded in mystery and linked to the lost gold through hearsay and speculation rather than hard evidence. In-depth analyses have attempted to separate fact from fiction, exploring the origins and developments of the Pitt Lake gold mine legend. Most historians who have examined the case believe it to be a compilation of different stories of a lost gold mine in the same region. Importantly, geologists have confirmed that the area in question is likely not suitable for the type of gold mine that's associated with this tale. Ultimately, my view on this lost gold mine, unlike the other lost gold mines that we've covered, is that this lost gold mine is almost certainly fictional. There's simply too many differing accounts and no real consistency between the narratives. Further, the expert evidence in the form of the geologist confirms to me that the sort of mine that the legend refers to probably can't exist in the region anyway. My view on this one is largely or almost entirely in line with the mainstream historical consensus. That said, despite my view on the Pitts Lake Lost Gold Mine, there are numerous people who are still out searching for it. The Lost Trading Port of Abascoon The lost trading city of Abascoon was once a bustling medieval port on the Caspian Sea. The exact location of the city is unknown, but it has been speculated to have been on an island near the shore of the Caspian Sea. This city, thriving in an era marked by extensive trade networks that spanned continents, served as a pivotal maritime hub on the Silk Road. Its strategic location facilitated the exchange of goods, ideas, and cultures, making it a linchpin in the economic and social dynamics of the region. The city is reported to have boasted a strong brick citadel. The wealth of the city was so widely known that Vikings proceeded down the Volga River to raid Abaskin multiple times. An initial exploratory raid occurred in the late 9th century AD, with a further raid around 910, followed by a large Viking attack on the city in 913. Later it provided refuge to Muhammad II, the Shah of the Khwarazmian Empire. Muhammad was fleeing advancing Mongol forces, and as a quick aside, Genghis Khan was, to put it mildly, not a fan of Muhammad II. Importantly, I note that this was the last known instance where the city is confirmed to have existed. A local legend recorded around the 14th century indicates that the city was sunken by changing water levels in the Caspian Sea. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to locate any data to either confirm or deny this assertion. My theory is that Abascoon was razed to the ground by Mongol forces. The following facts are known. Genghis Khan had a personal hatred of Muhammad II. The Mongols were enraged by walled cities. And further, people who provided aid and comfort to enemies of the Mongols were annihilated. Further, the last confirmed mention of the trading city is its decision to provide aid and comfort to Muhammad II. Further yet, Abascoon was known for its citadel a highly fortified area of the city to protect its wealth from raiders such as the Vikings 
or steppe nomads. Given that Avaskun provided aid to Muhammad II, along with all the other factors mentioned, I hypothesize that the Mongol force raised the city to the ground and ended all the inhabitants. Further, this explains why there's no evidence of a sunken city in the Caspian Sea. My hypothesis is entirely based on circumstantial evidence, but in my view, the circumstantial evidence is fairly strong in this instance. The Disappearance of Sarah McDiarmid In July 1990, Sarah McDiarmid, a 23-year-old Scottish-Australian, vanished without a trace. She was last seen leaving Cananook Railway Station in Melbourne, Victoria, after a tennis game with friends, sparked a prolonged and unresolved investigation. Witnesses saw her heading towards the dimly lit car park, and evidence suggested a violent encounter near her vehicle, marked by blood stains, a dropped lighter, and drag marks. Adding to the mystery, an ear witness claimed to hear a woman yelling, Give me my keys. Despite extensive efforts involving over hundreds of police officers and a 21-day search spanning air, sea, and land, no trace of her was found. Initial investigations pointed towards foul play, a conclusion supported by an inquest in 2006, which, however, could not clarify the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. Over the years, the reward for information leading to a resolution increased to $1 million, reflecting the case's complexity and the community's desperation for closure. Speculation connected Australian serial killers, including Paul Denner and Bandley Debs, to her case, though Denner explicitly denied involvement. Further, Debs was considered a person of interest based solely on police practices of linking unsolved cases to known serial offenders active in the area. These connections to serial slayers, however, remain speculative without concrete evidence to confirm their involvement. In the aftermath, Sarah's family sought to keep her memory alive and support others in similar situations through initiatives, including launching a website. This website, notalone.com.au, is no longer online, but can still be accessed through the Internet Archive. Hopefully for the sake of Sarah's family, this case can be resolved, and they can finally have the closure they deserve. Deloy's Ape The tale of Deloy's ape begins in the early 20th century with Francois Deloy, a Swiss geologist, during his expedition in search of oil in the remote jungles between Venezuela and Colombia. This region, known for its dense forests and challenging terrain, became the backdrop for one of the most compelling and enduring stories in cryptozoology. Deloy's encounter with a peculiar primate, which resulted in a photograph that would stir the scientific community and public imagination for decades, took place around 1920. The creature, reportedly encountered near the Tara River, exhibited unusual characteristics for New World monkeys. Notably, its bipedal stance and the absence of a tail, attributes that defy the common traits of known species in the region. The primate was said to stand approximately 4 feet 5 inches tall, further complicating its classification within the known primates of the region. The story gained significant attention when Georges Montandon, a French anthropologist and a friend of Deloy's, stumbled upon the photograph. Montandon, intrigued by the creature's human-like appearance and the possibility of it being a previously undiscovered species, gave it a scientific name. He proposed it as the only known ape of the Americas, potentially a missing link in human evolution. This claim, however, was met with skepticism and controversy. Skepticism which stemmed from the lack of additional physical evidence and the peculiar circumstances surrounding the photograph's background and presentation. Critics and skeptics have raised questions about the veracity of Deloy's account and the photograph's authenticity. Some suggest the primate could be a misidentified or manipulated specimen of a known species, such as a spider monkey. 
In favor of this hypothesis, skeptics have noted characteristics like the forward-facing nostrils and the absence of a tail as possible evidence of tampering. This skepticism is compounded by the involvement of Montandon, whose theories on human evolution and science generally have been completely discredited. Montandon's interest in the ape was seen by some as an attempt to support his controversial theories, casting further doubt on the legitimacy of the discovery. Montandon presented his case to the French Academy of Sciences, claiming the ape to be a quote-unquote American chimpanzee. Based on my research, I firmly believe the story of Deloitte's ape is a hoax, a conclusion I've reached after scrutinizing the details and context of its discovery. First, the only evidence we have is a single photograph, which in itself is highly suspicious. The creature in the image appears too similar to a known species, the spider monkey, with peculiarities like its posture and lack of a tail seeming artificially manipulated. Further, the involvement of Montandon, a figure with controversial views trying to push a dubious theory of human evolution, adds another layer of doubt. His eagerness to classify the ape as a new species without solid evidence or peer validation underscores the motive behind the hoax. He wanted to use the photograph to support his own theories, which would have brought him significant accolades in the scientific community, if true. Anyway, that said, something in the back of my mind finds the photograph of this quote-unquote ape extremely disconcerting. William Unek. William Unek was a figure whose life took a dark turn, culminating in two separate tragic events that shook the communities he targeted. Born around 1929, he was a police constable prior to turning to profound evil. In 1954, in the Belgian Congo, Unek was responsible for the loss of 21 lives in a horrific spree. The details of this event are scant, but it was reported that he used an axe, chopping at his victims indiscriminately. The reasons behind this act remain unclear with no motive fully ascertained. After this spree, Unek fled, eventually making his way to Tanganyika, modern Tanzania, blending into a new environment under a false identity. Three years later, in early 1957, Unek initiated another spree in the area of Malampaka, using a stolen police rifle, among other weapons. This time, his actions resulted in the deaths of 36 individuals, including men, women, and children. The brutality of these acts was unimaginable, with Unek employing a range of methods to carry out his attacks, including shooting, stabbing, burning, and strangling. Among the victims was reportedly his own wife, whom he killed before setting their home on fire. The aftermath of the second spree led to Tanganyika's largest manhunt at the time, involving local tribesmen, police, and the King's African Rifles. Despite the use of dogs and aircraft in the search, Unek evaded capture for nine days. He was eventually located due to the bravery of a local resident. Unek showed up at the home of Yumbu Benikumbu, who distracted Unek with food, drink, and conversation while his wife was sent to notify the police. Upon their arrival, a confrontation ensued, and Unek was mortally wounded. Ikumbu, recognized for his bravery, received a large financial reward and received the British Empire Medal for meritorious service in light of his actions and the lives he undoubtedly saved. The cause of William Unick's two sprees is entirely unknown and unfortunately the case is poorly documented. Further, it's unclear how many victims Unick may have had in total given the three years between his two rampages. And yes, before you leave a comment, this is unfortunately the best and only photograph of Unek available. Gloomy Sunday. Gloomy Sunday, also known euphemistically as the Hungarian self-ending song, is a tune with an urban legend attached. Composed in 1933 by the Hungarian pianist and composer Rezo Seres, 
it's a melody that has become synonymous with sorrow and despair. Despite its haunting beauty, it's most famous for the dark cloud of urban legends that surround it, suggesting that the song is linked to numerous untimely departures from life. The legend holds that Gloomy Sunday was connected to a significant number of unfortunate events in Hungary and beyond. In Vienna, Berlin, New York, and London, tales emerged of individuals who, overwhelmed by the song's melancholic melody and lyrics, chose to cease living. These stories contributed to the song's notoriety, leading to supposed bans by authorities in an attempt to curb its perceived negative influence. The most notable of these was the BBC's decision to prohibit the song's broadcast, deeming it too upsetting for the public during World War II. This restriction technically remained in place until 2002. However, I personally have my doubts as to whether it was followed until that time. The song's composer's life has only enhanced the tragic allure of this song. In 1968, he ceased existing due to his own hand, a final act that seemed to seal the song's legacy as one intertwined with tragedy. While the urban legend tries very hard to associate Gloomy Sunday with Rezo's self-ending, digging into his biography leads to a much sadder conclusion. He and his family were persecuted by the Nazis during World War II for their Jewish heritage. While Rezo was thankfully able to survive forced labor, many of his close family members sadly perished. This suggests a strong alternate candidate for the act he committed rather than the effects of Gloomy Sunday. Despite the grim lore surrounding it, Gloomy Sunday has been recorded by numerous artists over the years. Perhaps the most haunting rendition of the song, likely familiar to many viewers, is Billie Holiday's extremely melancholic version. All of that said, you're probably expecting me to dismiss this urban legend outright, but I'm not going to. The belief in Gloomy Sunday's negative effects could itself be harmful, a phenomenon known as the nocebo effect, where negative expectations lead to worse outcomes. This song, shrouded in urban legends of despair and misfortune, illustrates how collective belief can amplify a work's perceived impact. When people are convinced that engaging with this song leads to distress, they might experience heightened emotional turmoil merely by association, not the content itself. Further, this is exacerbated by the content itself being deeply melancholic. The Bain Family Slayings. This case was recommended by subscriber Boogity. On June 20th, 1994, a disturbing event unfolded in Dunedin, New Zealand that captured the nation's attention and sparked debates around justice and the legal system. Early in the morning, after completing his paper run, 22-year-old David Bain reported the tragic loss of his family. Upon arrival, authorities discovered five members of the Bain family had succumbed to gunshot wounds. Parents Robin, 58, and Margaret, 50, and their children Arawa, 19, Laniette, 18, and Stephen, 14. A cryptic message left on the family's computer hinted at a deeper story, leading to David's arrest four days later. This message said, Sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay. In what I can only describe as an absolutely ludicrous turn of events, two weeks after the slayings, the house where the slayings occurred was burnt down. And why, you ask, was this house burnt down? Well, because other members of the family requested that the house be burnt down. Problematically, the burnt down house contained the bloody footprints of the perpetrator. For reasons that are entirely unclear to me, these were not preserved. The initial investigation and subsequent trial navigated through a complex web of familial dynamics, allegations, and evidence. The prosecution argued that David executed his family members before fabricating a self-ending scene for his father, Robin. In contrast, 
the defense presented a scenario where Robin was the perpetrator, driven to despair by internal family issues, ultimately leading to the tragic events. The conviction of David Bain in 1995, followed by years of appeals, brought to light the intricate and often fraught relationship between legal interpretations and the quest for truth. The involvement of Joe Karam, a former rugby pro turned advocate, was pivotal in challenging the original convictions and spearheading a campaign for a retrial. Karam's unwavering support and the uncovering of new evidence led to the Privy Council's decision to quash the convictions, citing a quote, substantial miscarriage of justice. In 2009, a retrial was conducted, introducing new arguments and evidence regarding Robin Bain's potential motives and mental state. The defense suggested Robin was the true culprit, motivated by a desire to conceal his illicit relationship with his daughter, Laniette. After months of deliberation, David Bain was acquitted of all charges, a verdict that left the community and the nation divided. Despite his acquittal, the ordeal left David struggling to reintegrate into society, grappling with the stigma of his initial conviction and the years lost behind bars. Presently, this case technically remains unsolved. However, there are no active suspects in the case at present, nor are there any persons of interest. Given the evidence at the retrial, I think we can all draw the same conclusion as to the perpetrator of this heinous act. The death of Bruiser Brody. The tragic event that led to the demise of Frank Donald Goodish, famously known as Bruiser Brody, remains one of professional wrestling's darkest moments. On July 17, 1988, in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, Brody's life came to an untimely end under circumstances that would stir controversy and unanswered questions for decades to come. The conflict that led to Brody's demise began in the locker room of a wrestling event. Brody was asked by fellow wrestler Jose Gonzalez, known in the ring as Invader One, to discuss business in the shower area away from the rest of the locker room. This meeting turned fatal when Gonzalez inflicted severe injuries on Brody. Despite the immediate chaos and the efforts of fellow wrestlers to get medical help, Brody succumbed to his injuries. The police investigation and subsequent trial of Jose Gonzalez were marred by a lack of cooperation from witnesses and logistical mishaps. One of the biggest quote unquote logistical mishaps was the fact that the killing blade was never recovered. Key witnesses, including wrestlers who were present at the scene, received subpoenas too late, rendering their evidence moot as the jury had already reached a verdict. Gonzalez was acquitted of all charges with the defense claiming he acted in self-defense. This outcome left many within the wrestling community and Brody's family seeking justice that seemed forever out of reach. The story of Bruiser Brody's life and the circumstances of his death have been recounted in various wrestling documentaries and articles. Yet despite the passage of time, the complete truth of what happened in the locker room remains elusive. I anticipate that we will never have the truth of what happened in the locker room that fateful day. Jose Gonzalez was acquitted of the slaying and found to have acted in self-defense by a jury. Simply put, he has no incentive to ever say anything further, as whatever he says could be of no benefit to him and could only work against him. Further, Gonzalez continued to wrestle and enjoy a successful career in the Puerto Rican wrestling scene. Astonishingly, Jose Gonzalez only retired from wrestling in 2022 at the age of 74. The Ego Pogo. The Ego Pogo, a mysterious lake cryptid said to inhabit Lake Simcoe in Ontario, Canada, has been a subject of folklore and curiosity for almost two centuries. Known by several names, including Kempenfelt Kelly and Beaverton Bessie, this legendary lake monster has captivated imaginations and sparked debates about its existence and origins. The Ego Pogo is often described as a large, serpentine creature 
with distinctive features that set it apart from other cryptids. It has been likened to a dog-faced animal, with comparisons made to seals in terms of its appearance and behavior. Eyewitness accounts over the years have painted a picture of a creature that is both elusive and intriguing, with sightings suggesting a presence that defies conventional explanation. The first recorded sighting dates back to 1823, with notable instances reported throughout the 20th century, including a 1991 video recording that further fueled speculation and interest. Notably, the image you're looking at on screen now is a still from a now lost video of the incident. Several theories have been proposed to explain the Igopogo phenomenon. One popular theory suggests that the creature could be a relict population of an unknown species of aquatic animal, possibly related to seals. This theory is supported by the creature's seal-like characteristics described in various sightings. Another theory posits that the Ego Pogo might be a case of misidentification, with observers mistaking logs, waves, or known animals for a creature. Further, for group sightings, there's always the possibility of mass psychogenic illness type events, wherein multiple people experience what is in essence the same hallucination. Some skeptics completely deny the existence of the possibility of the creature and question whether the alleged sighting in 1823 actually occurred. These skeptics appear to be of the school of thought that would suggest that lake monsters became much more popular after Nessie mania in the 1930s. And just a quick reminder that if you enjoy my content, remember to like and subscribe. Your likes and subscriptions make it possible for me to devote virtually all of my free time to content creation. Seriously, thanks everyone. I couldn't do this without you. Olaf Palm. Here's a suggestion that comes from subscriber Hachi Seiko. Thanks for the suggestion. On the evening of February 28, 1986, an event shocked Sweden and the world. Olaf Palm, the Prime Minister of Sweden, was walking home with his wife, Lisbeth from the Grand Cinema in central Stockholm when his life was abruptly ended. The absence of bodyguards, a choice that reflected Palm's desire to live as ordinarily as possible despite his high office, left the couple vulnerable. The immediate aftermath saw a swift but ultimately futile effort to save him, with emergency services arriving on the scene within minutes. Despite these efforts, Palm was pronounced dead shortly after midnight on March 1st, 1986. Krister Pedersen, a convicted felon and petty criminal who had previously slain an individual during a street fight in 1970, was promptly arrested and charged with the slaying. Pedersen, denying involvement, claimed to have appreciated Palm's politics and stated he was not in central Stockholm when the incident occurred. Nevertheless, Elizabeth Palm's identification and acquaintances' claims placed him near the crime scene, resulting in his 1989 life sentence conviction. However, this was overturned months later due to evidentiary insufficiency and doubts about Elizabeth's identification. Following his release, Pedersen received compensation for his wrongful ordeal and attempted to turn the conviction into a career. After his release, he began engaging in media interviews where he flirted with confessions to the crime. These were not taken seriously, often dismissed as attempts to profit from media attention. Another suspect in the matter was Victor Gunnarsson, who was connected to right-wing extremist organizations. Due to claims of involvement and claimed harassment, he moved to the United States, where he was subsequently slain in 1993 in an unrelated incident. According to another theory, the South African government hired professionals to dispense with Olaf over his strong anti-apartheid stance. Another theory, which in my research appears to be considered to be highly controversial in Sweden, involves a man named Stieg Engström, better known as the Scandia Man. In 2018, a journalist proposed that Stieg Engström known as the Scandia Man, was the likely assailant in Olaf Palm's case. 
This was based on Engstrom's dislike for Palm, matching witness descriptions and Engstrom's apparent suspicious activities and media behavior post-event. Despite Engstrom's death in 2000, this theory gained attention and was later acknowledged by the Swedish Prosecution Authority in 2020. They stated that he had long been a suspect, but that he was never charged due to the likely inability to obtain a conviction. Further, I imagine one wrongful conviction in relation to the matter was already humiliating enough for the Swedish authorities. Also, as an aside, these are only a few of the theories related to this slaying. I suspect at this point the evidence has been too muddied for any conclusive resolution to the case to ever be expected. Jerusalem Syndrome Jerusalem Syndrome is a psychological phenomenon that strikes some individuals when they visit the ancient city of Jerusalem. This condition, unique due to its geographical specificity, manifests through intense religious experiences or delusions, often leading the affected person to believe they are figures from biblical narratives. It's a subject of interest for both psychologists and theologians, as it sits at the crossroads of mental health, religion, and the impact of historically significant locations on human consciousness. The syndrome typically unfolds in a few stages. Initially, the visitor might exhibit an overwhelming desire to detach from their tour group or companions to explore Jerusalem alone. Following this, they may engage in ritualistic acts, such as donning white robes made from hotel bed linens. They've also been known to preach in public spaces and conduct impromptu and unwanted quote-unquote baptisms, amongst other activities. In many cases, these actions are out of character for the individuals experiencing them and can lead to their hospitalization. Interestingly, the syndrome doesn't discriminate by religion. While it's more commonly reported among Christians, cases have been observed across various faiths. Experts theorize that the root causes of Jerusalem syndrome are multifaceted, blending the psychological impact of visiting a city so deeply embedded in human history and religion with pre-existing mental health conditions or susceptibilities. The syndrome can affect those with no history of mental illness, suggesting that the city's intense spiritual significance and the immersive experience of walking in the same spaces as historical religious figures can trigger profound psychological reactions. For some, the overwhelming realization of being in a place they've only read or heard about in religious texts can blur the lines between past and present, myth and reality. However, not all experts agree on a single cause. Some suggest that Jerusalem Syndrome is a manifestation of a pre-existing psychiatric condition that is triggered or exacerbated by the visit to Jerusalem. In these cases, the city acts as a catalyst rather than the root cause, bringing underlying issues to the surface. Despite its dramatic presentation, Jerusalem syndrome is generally temporary. Affected individuals typically return to their normal state of mind once they leave Jerusalem, often with little to no memory of their actions while under the influence of the syndrome. This transient nature raises questions about the interplay between place, belief, and mental health, suggesting a profound yet not fully understood impact of sacred spaces on the human psyche. In my view, being in Jerusalem for the faithful has the significant potential to cause a very real psychologically based warp in reality. Walking through the city could in essence make a sufferer of Jerusalem syndrome feel like they are live-action role-playing a scene from the Bible. I note that sufferers from Jerusalem Syndrome are universally on trips and almost always have some sort of disruption to their routine and sleep schedules. Disruption to sleep schedules has often been linked to the triggering of mental health issues. The Disappearance of Karen Louise Wilson On March 27, 1985, Karen Louise Wilson a 22-year-old political science major at the State University of New York at Albany, vanished under mysterious circumstances. Karen was last seen in Colony, New York, 
after visiting a local shopping mall where she purchased t-shirts in preparation for a spring break trip to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Despite having an appointment at the tanning hut that evening, she did not attend. Authorities believe Karen was headed back to the campus when she was possibly abducted near the entrance to Interstate 90 westbound and the Northway. The area was poorly lit and sparsely trafficked, making it feasible for an abduction to occur unnoticed. A sketch of an unidentified man seen in the vicinity around the time Karen disappeared was released, but he has never been identified or located. Despite extensive searches and investigations, no conclusive evidence has emerged regarding Karen's whereabouts post-disappearance. Speculations that she might have continued her travel plans to Florida were investigated, but ultimately led nowhere. Police are virtually certain she never left New York State. Like Suzanne Lyle's case, no meaningful leads have ever been generated in this case. Again, while it has been speculated that there may be a connection between the two cases, this is pure conjecture. The Krasu. The Krasu is a ghost deeply entrenched in Southeast Asian folklore, particularly in Thailand. This entity is visualized as a woman's head floating independently, with her viscera and internal organs dangling from her neck, creating a haunting nocturnal image. The Krasu preys on animals and, disturbingly, pregnant women and their newborns, consuming raw flesh and blood to satisfy its endless hunger. This spectral figure is said to be active at night, Origins of the Krasu are shrouded in folklore and vary across regions, with stories suggesting it could be a cursed individual who engaged in wrongful deeds in a previous life. Another tale recounts a princess involved in a tragic tale of betrayal and magic gone awry, leading to her transformation into the Krasu as a form of punishment or as a result of a failed spell. The curse is also believed to pass through generations, particularly among women involved in witchcraft or those who consume contaminated food or drink. The Krasu possesses notable powers, including the ability to float and the gruesome use of a long tongue to consume its victim's essence, often leading to the belief that it causes diseases or misfortunes. To protect against the Krasu, communities employ measures such as surrounding homes with thorny branches or burying placentas deep enough to be unreachable. From my research, Krasu sightings appear to be quite common, with the latest article I could find on a sighting indicating a 16-year-old Thai girl spotted a Krasu in January 2024. The disappearance of Paul Edwin Overby. In May 2014, Paul Edwin Overby Jr., an American author, disappeared in Afghanistan. Overby ventured into the perilous terrain of Coast Province, Afghanistan. His mission was ambitious, to conduct research for a book that aimed to shed light on the complexities of the Afghan conflict. On May 17, 2014, Overby was last seen as he prepared to cross into Waziristan, a region within Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas, known for its lawlessness and as a haven for militants. He intended to interview Sirajuddin Haqqani, a key figure in the Haqqani network, to gain insights into the group's perspectives and motivations. This undertaking was fraught with risks, as the area was notorious for its hostility towards foreigners and the presence of insurgent groups. The news of Overby's disappearance remained under wraps until January 2017, when his wife, Jane Larson publicly disclosed his identity and the circumstances surrounding his vanishing. This delay in making his situation public was aimed at safeguarding potential negotiations for his return. The FBI and other international agencies have since been involved in efforts to locate Overby. While Larson, his wife, believes that the Taliban were involved in his vanishing, the Taliban has explicitly denied a role in Overby's disappearance. In my view, while the Taliban may have been involved, 
no evidence which has been made public has indicated as such. The region where he disappeared is known for its lawlessness, and he could have been captured by any number of groups or individuals. On May 8, 2018, the FBI offered a $1 million reward for information leading to his rescue indicating that there may be evidence that he is alive. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Remember, it's your subscriptions that can make this the most extensive iceberg series ever. Also, check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership, and the Discord. Links are in the description. Shout out to my patrons, Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone. Welcome to part 12 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. In this series, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, internet mysteries, and more. The Burger Chef Slayings. This suggestion comes from subscriber Donnie Lusk. Thanks for the suggestion. Also remember to leave a comment with suggestions on cases. On November 17, 1978, a shocking event unfolded at a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana, that still remains unsolved. Four young employees disappeared after what seemed to be a robbery at their workplace. The four are speculated to have been abducted while they closed the restaurant, likely while they were taking out the day's trash. Their absence sparked concern among their families and eventually led to a dire discovery. All four were found deceased in a wooded area, 20 miles from the restaurant, still in their work uniforms. The brutality of the scene was unmistakable, with two victims executed by gunfire, one stabbed fatally, and the fourth succumbing to asphyxiation caused by blunt force trauma. This tragic outcome signaled a deliberate act of evil rather than a mere robbery gone wrong. The investigation into this case was plagued by missteps from its inception. Authorities initially treated the restaurant scene as a minor robbery allowing the business to reopen the next day, thereby contaminating potential evidence. The failure to secure the scene, combined with a lack of technological resources available at the time, severely hampered the investigative efforts. A witness initially came forward to state that she had seen two white men in their 30s leaving the restaurant area around the time of the crime. However, these men were never identified and never came forward. Over the years, the case saw various suspects and theories, but no definitive leads that led to a resolution. In 1984, inmate Donald Forrester claimed involvement to avoid a prison transfer, offering detailed accounts and offering to lead police to evidence locations. He offered to turn on his accomplices, but in a strange turn of events, the details of what he was planning to do were leaked. He recanted his story claiming coercion, and no charges were filed. Further, as no corroborating evidence was provided by Forrester, he was never charged in relation to the slayings either. Unfortunately, given the police decision to allow the restaurant to reopen prior to the finding of the missing individuals, as well as the passage of time, likely means this will remain unsolved. Proper evidence wasn't gathered from the scene prior to the reopening of the restaurant. Further, if any physical evidence from the scene was raised at trial, the failure to secure the scene would be an extremely strong point in favor of the defense. It's important to remember that the defense doesn't have to prove a single thing at trial in our common law system. Rather, the onus is entirely on the prosecution to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, the elements of the offense in question. The Disappearance of Ambrose Bierce Ambrose Bierce, born on June 24, 1842, in Meigs County, Ohio, became a titan of American literature with a body of work that encompassed satire, horror, 
and a reflection on the human condition. His journey from a young participant in the horrors of the Civil War to becoming one of the most celebrated figures in American literature is as fascinating as his mysterious disappearance in 1914, presumed in Mexico. Before delving into his disappearance, it's crucial to understand the man. Bierce's early life was marked by hardship and a penchant for literature, influenced by his family's modest but literary background. His service in the Civil War as a young man profoundly impacted him, providing a wealth of experiences that he later distilled into his writings. His military service was distinguished by bravery and a near constant engagement with death, which shaped his worldview and literary themes. Following the war, Bierce embarked on a career in journalism and literature in San Francisco. He quickly became a prominent figure in the literary scene, known for his sharp wit and satirical prowess. His writings, which included short stories, journalism, and satire, often reflected his cynicism towards human nature and society, earning him the nickname Bitter Bierce. Bierce's literary contributions are significant and still widely read today. I'm sure a large portion of you are familiar with works like An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, and perhaps most famously, The Devil's Dictionary. His storytelling, characterized by its dark humor, irony, and exploration of the supernatural, has led to comparisons with Edgar Allan Poe and has influenced countless writers, both American and international. Further, like Poe, Ambrose Bierce's end is also deeply shrouded in mystery. In 1913, at the age of 71, he embarked for Mexico, intrigued by the then ongoing Mexican Revolution. Despite various theories and sporadic reports, his fate remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of American literature. Some speculate he sought to join the revolution. Others suggest he was seeking a final adventure. Still others believe he met an untimely end at the hands of those who did not appreciate his sharp wit. Further, in one of his final letters, he arguably indicated that he was going there to seek an adventure of the end of his lifetime, to put it in YouTube-friendly terms. Despite extensive searches and investigations, including substantial interventions by the American government, no conclusive evidence has ever been found to determine his ultimate fate. According to Felix Sommerfeld, Pancho Villa's representative in Washington, Bierce was last seen in Chihuahua circa January 1914. However, I would take any evidence from Felix Sommerfeld with a grain of salt, as he was later outed as a German spy. In my view, having reviewed the evidence, there's simply not enough to draw any meaningful conclusions. I don't think we'll ever have a clear idea of what happened to Ambrose Bierce. The Phoenix Freeway Shootings Between August 27th and September 10th, 2015, the Phoenix area was gripped by a series of incidents that caused widespread terror amongst its residents. Dubbed the Phoenix Freeway Shootings, this sequence of events involved 11 separate incidents where projectiles damaged vehicles traveling along Interstate 10 and State Route 202. The community was on high alert as these incidents seemed to target random drivers, heightening the fear of being on the freeways. In the midst of this chaos, law enforcement agencies launched a massive investigation, pooling resources and expertise to apprehend the individual or individuals responsible. The investigation saw its first apparent significant breakthrough on September 11th when a man and woman were taken into custody. The man was allegedly boasting about his involvement in the shootings to friends. However, they were quickly released and later cleared of any involvement. The complexity of the case was further underscored by instances where road debris was initially mistaken for shooting-related damage complicating the task of distinguishing between related and unrelated incidents. This suggests that there may have been a mass hysteria element to some of the non-shooting incidents reported. Adding to the investigative challenges, on September 13th, 
three teenagers were arrested for conducting what appeared to be copycat attacks using a slingshot. However, they were determined not to be involved in the shooting incidents. The focal point of the investigation became Leslie Allen Merritt Jr., a 21-year-old landscaper arrested on September 18, 2015, in Glendale, Arizona. Initially, Merritt was charged with multiple felony counts, including aggravated assault and endangerment. Law enforcement officials falsely linked him to the first four shootings through ballistic tests on a pistol they claimed he owned, which was found in a pawn shop. In a dramatic turn of events, all charges against Merritt were dropped in April 2016, leading to a comprehensive clearing of his name in August 2020. In a rare turn of events in August 2020, a judge specifically cleared Merritt of all allegations and charges relating to the incident. Merritt's lawyers were able to negotiate a settlement for him for the injustice he suffered. However, the exoneration raised more questions. Who was responsible for the shootings? Unfortunately, due to the botched handling of the case and the laser focus on Merritt, an entirely innocent individual, we will likely never know who the perpetrator or perpetrators were. Mystery Airship Wave of 1896 to 1897. Big shout out to patron Jeffer Metcalf for providing this recommendation. In the late 19th century, the United States was gripped by a phenomenon that would become known as the Mystery Airship Wave of 1896 to 1897. This period marked one of the first major UFO waves in American history, occurring a decade before the Wright brothers' first flight. The sightings began in California in 1896 and quickly spread eastward, generating thousands of reports from citizens across the country. These accounts ranged from simple observations of unexplained lights in the night sky to detailed descriptions of blimp-like vessels carrying human-like occupants. Some witnesses even reported interactions with these beings, who occasionally claimed to be from Mars. The majority of sightings were reported as nighttime encounters with unidentified lights, with more elaborate narratives describing airships comparable to contemporary dirigibles. This widespread nature of the sightings contributed to the mystery and intrigue surrounding the phenomenon. The reports peaked in two phases. The initial wave in California in late 1896 and a subsequent wave across the central and eastern U.S. in the spring of 1897. Public reaction to these sightings was mixed, with responses ranging from awe and fascination to skepticism and outright dismissal. Many accounts were later attributed to misidentifications of celestial objects, such as planets and stars, or dismissed as hoaxes and practical jokes. Some believe the airships were secret experiments by inventors or the government, the theory going that these airships were prototypes. Others saw them as evidence of extraterrestrial visitation, which at the time largely consisted of Martian visitors reflecting the sensibilities of the time. In addition to the fantastical accounts and hoaxes, the airship sightings were a media sensation. Newspapers across the country reported on the phenomenon with varying degrees of credibility. Some papers sensationalized the sightings, while others aimed to debunk them through rational explanations or demonstrations of how easily the public could be fooled. Interestingly, the day before the first sightings in California, a newspaper called the Sacramento Bee published an article. In this article, it was claimed that an inventor from New York was allegedly planning to fly from New York to California. This event may have set in motion the first sightings, with many additional sightings being driven by mass hysteria over airships. Greenland Sharks the Greenland shark is one of the most fascinating and mysterious creatures to inhabit the ocean. This enigmatic creature, with its massive, slow-moving form, is not only one of the largest sharks in existence, but also holds the record for the longest lifespan of any vertebrate known to science. The Greenland shark is a marvel, with a body that can stretch up to 23 feet in length and weigh over 3,000 pounds. Characterized by a thick-set figure, small eyes, and a short, rounded snout, 
This species exhibits a variety of colors ranging from pale creamy gray to blackish brown. The Greenland shark's appearance is further distinguished by the frequent presence of the parasites which attach to the shark's eyes, leaving their eye sockets as hollowed out homes. You don't have to go back and play that again. Their eyes are eaten away and the sockets become comfy places for parasites to raise a family. However, this impairment does not seem to hinder the shark's survival, suggesting a reliance on other senses such as smell and hearing to navigate and hunt in the deep cold waters it calls home. The diet of the Greenland shark is as varied as its habitat, encompassing everything from fish to seals. However, the mystery of the Greenland shark is its incredibly long lifespan, estimated to be between 250 and 500 years. Scientists have attributed this extraordinary longevity to the shark's slow metabolism and adaptation to the frigid deep sea environments. These sharks do not reach maturity until around 150 years of age, making their life cycle vastly different from that of other shark species. Put more humorously, in an alternative universe where Greenland sharks watch reality TV, they would be watching 160 and pregnant. Recent scientific breakthroughs have enabled researchers to estimate the age of Greenland sharks more accurately through carbon dating of proteins found in the shark's eyes. One study, using this method, found a Greenland shark that could be as old as 512 years highlighting the species' potential for extreme longevity. At present, it appears that the true upper age limit of the Greenland shark is unknown. However, it would appear that somewhere in the depths of the North Atlantic, there is a shark that was alive during the conquest of Mexico and the early stages of the Reformation. Further, that same shark's great-great-grandparents may have been swimming the seas while Caesar was conquering Gaul. Also, despite the shark being toxic, you may have heard of the Icelandic delicacy based around this creature, hakarl, or fermented shark flesh. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel, asking you for a quick favor. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe button and hit that notification bell. My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. There's also Lazy Chill Zone merch available now. Check out the shop link on the video. The Skunk Ape. The Skunk Ape, regarded as Florida's version of Bigfoot, is a popular cryptid with a large group of believers. This cryptid, described as a large, hairy, foul-smelling, ape-like creature, has captivated the imagination of many, leading to a plethora of sightings, theories, and discussions about its existence. The creature is described as standing six to eight feet tall, weighing around 500 pounds, and is known for its distinctive, pungent odor akin to a mix between a skunk and roadkill. The first report of what might be a skunk ape was in 1818, when a local newspaper reported an ape active in the region. The first well-documented sighting occurred in 1957, when hunters claimed a large, smelly ape invaded their camp in the Everglades. This encounter set off a chain of sightings that continued to grow over the years. Notable years for skunk ape sightings include 1977, with multiple credible reports. One report in this year included a bus full of tourists witnessing the creature near a bridge. Another was a police officer in Key Largo describing an encounter with a large fur-covered creature emitting a high-pitched wail. The early 2000s saw another spike in reported sightings due to a photograph which raised the profile of the creature substantially. In 2000, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office received a pair of photos sent anonymously, showing a large, hairy creature resembling an ape. The anonymous sender, who claimed to be an elderly woman, said the creature had been taking apples from her porch near I-75. 
She managed to snap pictures of it, concerned it might be an orangutan on the loose that could pose a danger to the community. If you're just listening to this video, I encourage you to take a moment to look at the picture on screen right now. This is the skunk ape claimed to have been seen by the anonymous writer. My view is that the anonymous nature of the letter serves to discredit this photograph, which otherwise looks extremely convincing. The alleged elderly woman claimed to be concerned that there was a marauding ape in her backyard and was so concerned about it that she sent a photograph. However, despite this quote unquote concern, she didn't tell the police where they could find her and never followed up to have them investigate. Only a general area was given, which does not accord with someone who is genuinely concerned about a marauding ape. Further, the inclusion in the letter that the writer is elderly may have been intended to disarm skeptics. I'll come back to my analysis of the photograph at the end of this section. Skunk ape skeptics argue that the lack of concrete evidence, such as clear photographic proof or biological specimens, makes the existence of the skunk ape improbable. Skeptical investigators suggest that sightings could be attributed to misidentification of wildlife. The most common explanation is the American black bear, some of which may suffer from mange, making them appear more ape-like. You're probably expecting me to dismiss the skunk ape, but I'm not going to do that. Unlike other cryptids, the skunk ape is sighted with stunning regularity and over a long period of time. While some individuals are undoubtedly claiming skunk ape sightings for a laugh or as a hoax, numerous credible witnesses have also reported them. I think the skunk ape can be explained by a wide variety of factors, some of which include actual great apes. In terms of the ape theory, I would suggest that some of the sightings could be explained by escapees from private zoos and enclosures. However, this is speculative since I wasn't able to locate any stories of actual apes being captured in Florida. This, however, may explain the quite credible looking ape photograph. I would also suggest that the black bear theory likely accounts for a number of sightings. People are generally unaware of how fast bears can move bipedally. Skunk apes are also said to let out a loud wail, which can also be associated with bears. Another theory I would put forth is a mass hysteria type event, particularly following well-known sightings. During periods when the skunk ape is quote unquote, trending, people are likely much more susceptible to believing the black bear they saw is actually a skunk ape. Anyway, this is one cryptid I really would love your input on. What are your theories on the skunk ape? The disappearance of Ryan Liu. On July 9th, 2023, Ryan Liu disappeared from his home in Richmond, British Columbia, Canada. He was last seen leaving his home in the Dayton Court area around 8 p.m. on the night in question. Despite the efforts of local law enforcement, Ryan's whereabouts remain unknown. Police later found footage of him walking south on Taylor Way at Main Street in West Vancouver around 10 p.m. the same night, believed to be heading towards the area of the Lions Gate Bridge. Theories regarding Ryan's disappearance are numerous, ranging from the possibility of an intentional departure to the more sinister. Unfortunately, details related to Ryan's disappearance are quite limited. However, the Richmond Royal Canadian Mounted Police are still actively investigating the case. If you have any information with respect to his whereabouts or case, please contact the Richmond RCMP Department with details. The Casa Obake The Casa Obake is a yokai or monster from Japanese folklore. Originating from the concept of Tsukumogami, where household objects gain a spirit after a hundred years, the Casa Obake represents an umbrella that has come to life. The creature is often characterized by a single eye, a single leg, and sometimes depicted with a long, prehensile tongue. The Casa Obaki's roots can be traced back to the Edo period, when it became popularly depicted in art of the era. But more on this in a moment. 
Its depiction often varies, but the core elements, a playful spirit, a single eye, and the ability to hop around on one leg remain virtually consistent across interpretations. Powers attributed to the creature include its ability to startle or surprise humans, often in a playful rather than malevolent manner. While it can sometimes use its tongue to lick people, this action is more mischievous than harmful. Interestingly, despite the ubiquitous nature of this yokai in modern Japanese culture, unlike other yokai, there does not appear to have ever been a genuine belief in this particular creature. The leading theory is that they were invented during the Edo period to fill out the world of known yokai. To put it in modern terms, they were fictional content easily adapted into the yokai stories, which had a long-running basis in the popular culture and folklore of the time. At any rate, they've become so popular now that their later and likely intentionally fictional origin has been all but forgotten. The Death of Alexei Navalny Alexei Navalny, a prominent Russian opposition leader, lawyer, and anti-corruption activist, passed away on February 16, 2024. Born on June 4, 1976, Navalny had established himself as perhaps the most vocal critic of President Vladimir Putin and his administration, focusing particularly on corruption within the Russian government. Despite facing numerous arrests and a near-fatal poisoning in 2020, Navalny remained steadfast in his opposition, leading to his final incarceration. In August 2023, Navalny was sentenced to imprisonment until December 2038. In December 2023, Navalny went missing for three weeks. He later re-emerged in a penal colony in the yamalo nenets region of northwestern Siberia, the circumstances surrounding Navalny's death are contentious and have led to international outcry and speculation. Official reports from the Russian prison service suggest that Navalny, quote, felt unwell following a walk within the penal colony and lost consciousness almost immediately. Despite resuscitation efforts, he was declared deceased, apparently virtually immediately. The exact causes of his demise are under investigation, with extreme doubt being cast upon the official version by virtually the entire international community. I hope to have an update on this case in a future edition to this series. Also, by way of footnote, this video was recorded a day after Navalny's passing, and as such, the facts will likely evolve from here. Camelot. Camelot the legendary castle and court associated with King Arthur is perhaps the most well-known castle in history. However, like with everything from the King Arthur story, also known more academically as the Matter of Britain, it's shrouded in layers of mystery. The concept of Camelot first appears in the works of 12th century French romances, notably in the Lancelot Grail cycle. This depiction of Camelot was influenced by earlier descriptions of Arthur's court, such as those found in Geoffrey of Monmouth's accounts of Caerleon. However, Camelot's detailed and idealized portrayal, complete with its grand castle, magnificent cathedral, and the round table, owes much to these French narratives. These stories painted Camelot not just as a physical location, but as a symbol of Arthur's reign, embodying ideals of chivalry, justice, and noble questing, particularly the pursuit of the Holy Grail. Despite its prominence in literature, the exact location of Camelot has remained elusive, with various sites in Britain being linked to Arthurian legends. Caerleon in South Wales, for instance, has historical ties to Roman Britain and has been associated with Arthur's court in early sources. This connection is supported by the Welsh origins of many Arthurian tales. As discussed in a previous entry in this series, these stories, alongside archaeological evidence and ancient poetry, suggest that Arthur, or the people he was based on, might have been a Welsh or Romano-British leader who fought against Anglo-Saxon invaders. Another significant site is Cadbury Castle in Somerset, 
an Iron Age hill fort that has been proposed as a possible location for Camelot. Archaeological findings indicate that it was a fortified site with evidence of occupation and use that could correspond to the Arthurian period. Local traditions and the fort's strategic significance bolster its candidacy as Arthur's stronghold, or at the very least, as a stronghold of a warlord who fought against the Anglo-Saxons, which is in essence what Arthur was. Tintagel Castle in Cornwall is linked to Arthur's legend as his birthplace, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth. Archaeological excavations have uncovered evidence of Romano-British occupation. Amazingly, an inscription was revealed, which indicated that one of the ancestors of King Arthur, mentioned by Geoffrey of Monmouth, occupied the castle. Archaeological excavations remain active at Tintagel Castle, with the hope of new and significant findings in coming years. As an aside, when I became fascinated with Arthurian legend as a kid, I had always remembered Tintagel being presented with absolute certainty as Camelot. If you're a fan of Mandela effects, I guess you could say I'm from the Tintagel Camelot universe. Sorry couldn't resist that one. In my view, Camelot, as we imagine in our collective mind, as a late medieval fortress with medieval knights, does not and cannot exist. That said, the Camelot associated with the inspiration for the historical King Arthur, or one of the historical inspirations, may very well be found with certainty someday. Remember to like and subscribe and also hit that notification bell. Also check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership and the Discord. Click the links in the description of this video. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out. Welcome to part 13 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. In this series, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, internet mysteries, and more. Also, big shout out to subscriber and Discord community member Hachi Seiko, for their amazing work improving the Lazy Chill Zone cat. The Disappearance of Kelly Day Wilson. This is a special request from subscriber Lauren Seal Gonzalez, who grew up with her and wants to increase exposure to her case. The Disappearance of Kelly Wilson, a 17-year-old from Gilmer, Texas, on January 5, 1992, remains an enigma. On the night she vanished, Wilson was last seen leaving her workplace, Northeast Texas Video, around 8.30 p.m., intending to go to a nearby bank to deposit her paycheck. The following morning, her stepfather discovered her car parked at her workplace, its tires slashed and flat. Wilson's belongings, including her purse, were found inside the car, but the keys were missing. No trace of Kelly has ever been found. However, Investigators presume that she is deceased. The investigation into Wilson's disappearance has been fraught with controversy and intrigue, including allegations of cult activities and accusations against local law enforcement. Initially, the case saw the arrest of Michael Beebe in connection with the tire slashing incident, although he was not linked to Wilson's disappearance. The focus also briefly turned to Wilson's boyfriend at the time, Chris Denton, who was considered a prime suspect. However, Denton was never charged in relation to the incident and is now deceased. The case took a significant and bizarre turn in 1994 when Sergeant James Brown and seven others were indicted by a grand jury. The charges suggested a narrative that intertwined Wilson's disappearance with satanic rituals but the case was eventually dismissed. According to the Texas Attorney General, the satanic cult theory was completely baseless and a complete distraction from Kelly Wilson's disappearance. I note that this theory emerged 
during the echoes of the period in the United States, known as the Satanic Panic, which has been previously discussed in this series. Unfortunately, this baseless rabbit hole theory took valuable investigative resources and appears to have torn apart the community of Gilmer, Texas. Further, the sensationalist allegations, which brought media attention to the case, did little to focus on the cause of justice for Kelly. Despite the passage of time, the case remains open and active, though it has gone cold. At present, there are no active suspects or persons of interest in her case. The Gilmer Police Department continues to seek information that could lead to resolving the mystery of what happened to Kelly Wilson. If you have information which could assist the police in this matter, please contact the Gilmer Police Department. The Slaying of Holly Palmer. This case was suggested by subscriber Honora Jean. In the quiet town of Granbury, Texas, located just outside the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan region, the unresolved case of Holly Palmer still looms large over the community. Holly Palmer was just 23 years old, with her entire life ahead of her. The slaying occurred on November 27, 1988, at a now-demolished Greyhound bus station, marking a day of profound tragedy for the Palmer family and the wider community. Holly was found to have succumbed to blunt force trauma, a grim detail that underscores the brutality of the act. The absence of robbery as a motive suggests a deeply personal dimension to the crime. In 2013, the Granbury police chief indicated that Holly may have known her assailant. This detail has propelled theories suggesting a crime of passion, yet despite decades of investigation and the evolution of forensic technology, the case remains open with no charges laid. Given the active ongoing investigation, the police have remained tight-lipped about the specifics of evidence in the matter. However, there may be a break in the case on the horizon. In my research, I was able to locate an article published on December 18, 2023 on WFAA, a local Dallas news station. In this article, Granbury Police Detective Russell Gizzard advised that as of December 2023, new advanced DNA analysis techniques are being employed in relation to the investigation. Further, the detective advised that the quote, person of interest is a Granbury resident. Despite the passage of time, the family's resolve for answers and accountability remains undiminished, with her sisters being particularly strong advocates on her behalf. Even though this case is 35 years old, given the active status of the investigation and potential new DNA breakthroughs, I hope to have an update on Holly's case in a future episode. If you have any information that could assist in the investigation of Holly Palmer's slaying, I very strongly encourage you to reach out to the Granbury Police Department. Kanye Quest 3030. Kanye Quest 3030, released in July 2013, is a hip-hop-themed science fiction role-playing game that became known for more than just its gameplay. Players embark on a journey with Kanye West after he falls into a portal to the year 3030, a dystopian future ruled by a clone of Lil B the Based God. In this world, Kanye teams up with other rappers to fight for freedom. However, the game's notoriety isn't due to its creative plot or gameplay. In 2015, a player discovered a hidden level by typing Ascend into a dialog box, which led to speculation about the game's connection to an alleged real-life cult known as Ascensionism. This secret section presented a narrative that the main game was a facade for a deeper purpose. The game then transitions into a narrative that suggests the main storyline was a cover for this hidden section, involving tasks and QR codes related to the cult. This discovery sparked theories about the game's potential use as a recruitment tool by a cult that believes in reincarnation and sought to expand its membership through the game. Despite these dark undertones, it's speculated that this aspect of the game could be part of an abandoned alternate reality game, or ARG. The creator of Kanye Quest 3030 initially known only as Phoenix, 
was later revealed to be Clara Hope, an artist from Adelaide. This revelation came from a documentary web series which explored the game's mysteries and its creator's intentions. The series shed light on Hope's motivations and the integration of the Ascensionism subplot, initially intended as a separate project. However, despite this admission, the internet urban legend that this game was a real cult recruitment tool continues to persist, fueled by out-of-date YouTube videos. The Castration Serial Slayer. Between 1980 and 1986, a series of tragic events unfolded across at least five U.S. states, including Wyoming, Pennsylvania, Utah, Georgia, and Connecticut. Young men were kidnapped, shot in the back of the head, and then had male parts removed post-mortem. This string of incidents, known as the castration serial slayings, initially appeared to be unrelated due to the vast geographic spread of the crime scenes. However, by 1989, forensic evidence linked two of the victims through the use of the same revolver. This suggested a single individual's involvement in at least these two cases. The first suspected victim, 27-year-old Willard Edward Judd, was discovered in 1980 near Casper, Wyoming. Following him, Wayne Lee Rifendifer, Marty James Shook, an unidentified individual in Georgia, and Jack Franklin Andrews were found under similarly gruesome circumstances. Despite the brutality of these acts, and some investigative leads including a suspect in San Francisco found with preserved male parts, the case remains unsolved and is considered a cold case. The case of the castration serial slayings is particularly challenging due to the lack of conclusive evidence linking all the crimes conclusively to one perpetrator. Further, aside from the two cases mentioned, there is nothing to definitively tie these slayings together. Hey everyone, Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel, asking you a favor. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you all along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. Stull Cemetery. In the heart of Kansas lies Stull Cemetery, an unassuming burial ground surrounded by the echoes of a chilling legend. Nestled between Topeka and Lawrence, Stull's story intertwines with the supernatural, making it a focal point for those fascinated by the paranormal. This tale begins in the 1970s, when an article sparked widespread intrigue, claiming Stull Cemetery as a gateway to hell. In this article, it was claimed that local lore said that this is a place where the devil himself would appear twice a year, on Halloween and the spring equinox. The origin of Stull's haunting legend is allegedly deeply rooted in its history. The town of Stull, established in the mid-19th century by Pennsylvania Dutch immigrants, was once a bustling community. However, as time passed, it dwindled, leaving behind the eerie Stull Cemetery and the ruins of the Evangelical Emmanuel Church, which became central to the legend. The church, which lay in ruins until being demolished in 2002, was rumored to be a site of dark rituals, further fueling tales of the cemetery's sinister aura. Over the decades, Stull Cemetery has been shrouded in a myriad of stories, from mysterious staircases leading to the underworld, to spectral figures and unexplained phenomena. Despite the allure of these tales, extensive gatherings on significant dates such as Halloween and the spring equinox have failed to yield any sighting of the devil or the supposed stairway to hell. Skeptics and local residents often dismiss the stories as fabrications, emphasizing the lack of historical evidence to support the supernatural claims. Many argue that the legend of Stull Cemetery was largely constructed by imagination 
and popularized by media, rather than being based on factual events or occurrences. You may be expecting an outright dismissal of the claims related to Stull Cemetery, but there is reason to believe in the subjective truth of these claims to those affected. The legend of Stull Cemetery, renowned as a gateway to hell, has the potential to spark mass psychogenic illness, also known as mass hysteria, and fuel individual paranormal sightings. This is a phenomenon where the power of suggestion and social influence can lead to the manifestation of physical symptoms or behaviors in individuals or a group. As individuals visit Stull, primed by tales of supernatural occurrences, they might experience heightened anxiety, fear, or even hallucinations. This can cause them to mistake ordinary sights and sounds for paranormal activity. The group setting and shared expectations can amplify these effects, leading to a collective experience of unexplained phenomena. This susceptibility is particularly pronounced during organized visits on significant dates like Halloween. Participants in these visits have collective anticipation and fear that can trigger psychological responses mimicking encounters with the supernatural. The human mind's tendency to validate beliefs through selective perception is extremely strong. As such, visitors may unconsciously interpret natural occurrences as supernatural, further perpetuating the legend and its psychological impact. Also, let's be honest, even the most skeptical people tend to enjoy a good scary paranormal tale. The Disappearance of Harold Holt In December 1967, Australia faced a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. The disappearance of its then Prime Minister, Harold Holt. On a seemingly ordinary summer day, Holt vanished while swimming at Cheviot Beach, near Port Sea, Victoria, leading to a whirlwind of speculation, theories, and unanswered questions. This incident not only marked a significant moment in Australian history, but also sparked a range of conspiracy theories. Despite warnings about the dangerous conditions that day, Holt, a reputed strong swimmer, entered the water and was tragically swept away by the undertow. His disappearance prompted one of the largest search operations in Australian history, yet no evidence of his body was ever found. The immediate aftermath of Holt's disappearance saw John McEwen, the leader of the country party, being sworn in as prime minister and a memorial service attended by international dignitaries. However, the lack of concrete evidence regarding Holt's fate fueled widespread speculation and numerous conspiracy theories. Some of these ranged from theories about Holt's mental state and personal life, including alleged affairs and political pressures. Other theories promote more far-fetched ideas involving espionage and defection to foreign powers. One of the most enduring theories suggested that Holt was a Chinese spy and had been picked up by a submarine a claim that has been met with skepticism and dismissal. Other theories posited involvement by the CIA. This theory suggests Holt was preparing to withdraw support for the Vietnam War. Another theory, which I will phrase euphemistically, is that he intended to take one last swim on the day in question. Despite these speculations, a formal inquiry by the Victorian coroner in 2005 concluded that Holt had drowned a finding that did little to quell the public's fascination with the case. In my view, sometimes an unfortunate drowning is just that. Swimming in the ocean is an inherently dangerous activity and can go wrong extremely quickly. Further, the fact that his body was never recovered is not suspicious in the context, given that he appears to have been swept away in the undertow into the ocean. The Original Mandela Effect The Mandela Effect, a term first coined in 2009, has intrigued and bewildered people worldwide. It represents a phenomenon where a large group of individuals shares a false memory, believing in an event that never happened or happened differently from reality. 
Contrary to the true events, many people allegedly vividly recall Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s while he was imprisoned in South Africa. This collective false memory has puzzled experts and laypersons alike. The belief has sparked debates and theories about how such a significant number of people could remember a major historical event so inaccurately. Nelson Mandela, however, did not pass away in the 1980s, but lived until December 5, 2013, when he died at the age of 95. Further, Nelson Mandela served as the first president of post-apartheid South Africa throughout the middle to late 1990s. The origin of the Mandela Effect lies in the experiences of Fiona Broom, a paranormal researcher. Broom discovered that she, along with many others, shared this particular false memory. Intrigued by this widespread anomaly, she set up a website to explore and document such instances, naming the phenomenon after the very misconception that sparked her interest. The theory has since developed, overlaid with ideas of the multiverse and multiple competing timelines. Anyway, I'm from the 2013 Mandela Death Universe, so perhaps I just can't relate to this one. The Slaying of Jill Lynn Udo. In January 2001, the community of Syracuse, New York, was shaken by the tragic loss of 18-year-old Jill Lynn Uto. Born on March 20, 1982, Uto was an ambitious young woman studying to become a paramedic while working at a local clothing store. Her life was cut short when she was found deceased in her apartment by her mother, Joanne Browning, a day after she failed to show up for a planned Super Bowl viewing with her family. This day marked the beginning of a long, unresolved investigation into her demise. Jill Lynn's apartment showed no signs of forced entry, and it appeared that nothing was stolen. The details surrounding the case suggest that the incident occurred in the early afternoon, with the assailant using one of Jill Lynn's own kitchen knives. Despite extensive investigations, interviews, and public appeals, no suspects have been publicly identified, leaving the case unsolved to this day. The lack of closure has had a profound impact on Udo's family and the community. Joanne Browning, who passed away in 2007, dedicated her years following the incident to raising awareness and seeking justice for her daughter. The Syracuse Police Department continues to investigate the case, aided by advances in forensic technology and the dedication of cold case units. If you have any information pertaining to this case, please reach out to the Syracuse Police Department. Phantom Social Workers. In the late 20th century, the UK was gripped by a series of alarming reports involving individuals posing as social workers, a phenomenon that became known as the phantom social worker scare. These imposters, often described as well-dressed and professional, allegedly visited homes to inspect children under the guise of official duty, sparking widespread fear among parents. The incidents led to a significant police investigation known as Operation Child Care, which aimed to uncover the truth behind these reports. Despite over 250 cases being reported, very few were deemed genuine, highlighting the mass hysteria and paranoia that had taken hold. The origins of these stories are rooted in real concerns about child welfare and the role of social workers. Many of the reported encounters involved individuals requesting to see children for inspections or evaluations, leading to suspicions of attempted abductions. However, investigations revealed that most of these incidents were unfounded, with authorities suggesting that a mix of genuine misunderstanding and outright fabrications to blame. The phenomenon was not limited to the UK. Similar reports emerged in the United States, Notably, these phantom social worker sightings peaked around the time of the satanic panic, when parents were on extremely high alert and extremely anxious. Given that no evidence of these sorts of activities were ever uncovered by the authorities, it appears that the phantom social worker phenomenon may be a case of mass hysteria.
That said, there's always the possibility that bad actors use the phantom social worker mass hysteria to cover their tracks. Under this hypothesis, these bad actors may have used this event as a smokescreen, assuming police would be unlikely to take seriously any accounts of, quote, phantom social workers. The Men in Black. The Men in Black, also known as MIB, have intrigued the public and conspiracy theorists alike, evolving from obscure folklore to mainstream cultural phenomena. Their origins trace back to the early encounters of UFO witnesses who reported visits by mysterious figures dressed in black, aiming to silence their extraterrestrial sightings. The first notable incident occurred in 1947 when Harold Dahl claimed to have been warned by a man in black about discussing his UFO sighting. This event, alongside others like the encounter of ufologist Albert K. Bender in the mid-1950s, cemented the MIB and UFO conspiracy lore. These figures were described as government agents, or sometimes as otherworldly beings themselves, tasked with keeping the knowledge of UFOs and extraterrestrial life from the public eye. Their popular depiction has ranged from sinister government agents and eventually to protagonists in a blockbuster film series starting with Men in Black, released in 1997. Whatever the truth may be, these menacing figures have embedded themselves in UFO folklore. Otto Brown and the Long March. Otto Brown, a German communist known by his Chinese name, Li Di, played a pivotal role in one of the most significant events in Chinese history, the Long March. Brown's background, marked by his involvement in German communist counter-espionage, paramilitary activities, and his eventual move to Moscow, set the stage for his later work in China. The Long March was a strategic military retreat undertaken by the Red Army of the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP. The purpose of this was to escape the encirclement by the nationalist KMT forces and spanned from October 1934 to October 1935. This retreat saw various Red Army factions navigate through some of China's most challenging terrains ultimately consolidating in Shanxi province. Brown's role in the Long March and his influence on the CCP's military strategies are subjects of considerable historical debate. However, there is considerable belief that he may have been the individual who initially proposed the Long March itself. Dispatched to China by the Soviets after training in Moscow, Brown was placed in a position of significant authority within the Red Army. However, his tactics and training and his experiences in Germany and the Soviet Union were not suited to the Chinese context. He was subsequently dismissed from major roles on the Long March. While it's never been confirmed that he first proposed the Long March, if he did, he is likely one of the most influential people in world history that virtually no one has heard of. The Bloop In 1997, a mysterious sound known as the bloop was detected by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the NOAA. This sound, characterized by its unusual strength and ultra-low frequency, made waves at the time. Initially, the source of the bloop was a subject of much speculation. It was detected by hydrophones, underwater microphones, placed over 5,000 kilometers apart in the Pacific Ocean, indicating its extraordinary volume and reach. Early theories about its origin ranged from giant marine animals to unknown underwater phenomena. Its profile was distinct from biological noises like whale calls, which typically have a more defined tonal quality, and from human-made sources such as submarines or ships. After years of investigation, NOAA researchers determined that the bloop was most likely caused by an ice quake, a seismic event resulting from fracturing ice. This conclusion was supported by similarities between the bloop's audio signature and those of known ice quakes. The sound was attributed to the cracking and breaking of ice from an Antarctic glacier, a process known as ice calving. 
This phenomenon involves large chunks of ice detaching from an ice shelf and generating powerful sounds that can travel long distances underwater. While the mystery is largely considered to be solved, some still theorize about the potential for this to have been caused by a gigantic marine animal. From my perspective, I would imagine if this noise was caused by a marine creature, we would be hearing a lot more bloops. Yamashita's Treasure The legend of Yamashita's treasure traces its roots back to World War II. During this time, the Japanese Imperial Army, led by General Tomoyuki Yamashita, allegedly looted vast amounts of gold and valuables from Southeast Asia. The treasure, named after the general, is said to have been hidden in caves, tunnels, and underground complexes in the Philippines to prevent it from falling into the hands of the approaching American forces. Despite numerous treasure hunts and investigations spanning over seven decades, the existence of such a treasure remains unverified. Further, historians question the feasibility of transporting and hiding such a massive loot deposit under the wartime conditions of the 1940s. They argue that logistical and historical constraints make the story of Yamashita's treasure implausible. The Japanese were losing control of the seas by 1943, making it unlikely for them to transport valuable treasure to the Philippines, a region on the verge of being overtaken by American forces. The most notable legal case related to the treasure involved Rogelio Roxas. Roxas, a Filipino treasure hunter, claimed to have discovered part of the treasure in 1971, including a golden Buddha and gold bars. Roxas subsequently sued former Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos for theft and human rights abuses over seizure of the treasure. The case concluded in Roxas's favor in a Hawaiian court, which found evidence supporting his discovery. Despite this, the court's decision did not definitively prove the existence of Yamashita's treasure as a whole. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Like I said, I plan to make this the most extensive iceberg series ever, so get on board and subscribe. Remember to leave a comment below if there's a case or topic you would like me to cover. Also, check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership in the Discord. All the links are in the description of this video. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Also, shout out to new YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay healthy and peace out. Welcome to part 14 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. In this series, we deep dive cases including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, internet mysteries, and more. The Slaying of Daisaku Chiba. In January 2007, the quiet streets of Kyoto, Japan, were shaken by a tragic event that took the life of Daisaku Chiba, a 20-year-old university student with a bright future ahead. Chiba, an aspiring manga artist, was attending his first year at Kyoto Seika University. His life was abruptly and senselessly ended one evening as he was bicycling home. The incident occurred around 7.45 p.m., when an unidentified individual, described by witnesses as a man in his 20s or 30s, confronted Chiba. In a shocking and unprovoked attack, Chiba was stabbed over a dozen times, including wounds to his chest and stomach, ultimately leading to his demise at a nearby hospital. Despite his critical condition, Chiba was able to communicate briefly, expressing confusion and dismay stating he had no idea who his assailant was. Locals, not accustomed to violence, were left in disbelief as news of the violent act spread. His loss was deeply felt by the university community and beyond, prompting his professors and classmates to take a unique approach in seeking justice. In an effort to gather information and possibly lead to the capture of the assailant, the faculty of manga at Kyoto Seika University embarked on an innovative campaign. They created and distributed a manga pamphlet, detailing Chiba's life and the circumstances of his untimely passing. This 20-page pamphlet, split between describing the suspect 
and celebrating Chiba's life was distributed at key locations, including the main Japan Railway Station in Kyoto. The initiative aimed not only to solicit leads that could assist in the investigation, but also to honor Chiba's memory and generate interest in his case. Unfortunately, despite this caring gesture, his slaying still remains unsolved. Importantly, in 2022, the Japanese National Police Agency offered a substantial sum of money for information relating to the arrest of the perpetrator. If you have any information that may be helpful to police, as usual, I strongly encourage you reach out to the relevant authorities. The Disappearance of Julie Wefflin This case comes by way of recommendation from subscriber Vaden K. Remember to leave recommendations on any cases or mysteries you want covered in the comments below. On September 16, 1987, Julie Ann Wefflin, a 28-year-old employee of the Bonneville Power Administration in Spokane, Washington, vanished under mysterious circumstances. The day she disappeared, Wefflin was working alone tasked with maintaining and inspecting power equipment at a remote substation near Riverside State Park. She logged into the Spring Hill substation in the afternoon, and it's believed she returned to her minivan around 3.45 p.m., intending to head back. However, she never made it. Instead, what was left at the scene painted a grim picture. Her hard hat, toolbox, a water bottle and sunglasses were found scattered on the ground beside her vehicle. Further, her vehicle had its driver's side door and back hatch open, and her purse still inside, indicating a sudden and forcible departure. The investigation into Julie Wefflin's disappearance has been extensive, yet fraught with challenges. The physical evidence at the scene that the investigators have disclosed to the public include drag marks and unfamiliar tire tracks near her vehicle. Investigators have publicly proposed that she may have been overpowered by two people, though the specific reasoning for this assertion is unknown. Investigators have also publicly advised that she was likely slain. However, at present, she remains officially classified as missing. As usual during an open investigation, numerous details cannot be disclosed to the public. Despite these clues and a significant reward offered for information leading to the resolution of the case, her fate remains unknown, and no suspects have been formally identified. If you have any information in relation to this case, please contact the Spokane County Sheriff's Office, the Lufthansa Heist. The Lufthansa Heist, executed on December 11, 1978, at John F. Kennedy International Airport, remains one of the most brazen thefts in American history. Unlike most unsolved mysteries in this series, the Lufthansa heist is extremely well documented. Thought to be orchestrated by James Burke, a notable figure associated with the Lucchese crime family, this heist was one of the largest operations in American history. The operation was estimated to have secured five million in cash and almost a million in jewelry totaling just shy of six million in 1978 currency. Adjusted for inflation, this amount would be equivalent to approximately 30 million today, highlighting the heist's monumental scale. The operation was allegedly meticulously planned over several months, exploiting inside information provided by Louis Werner, a Lufthansa cargo agent and gambler in debt. Werner, Allegedly aware of the monthly arrival of large cash sums exchanged in Germany, saw an opportunity for a significant score. He is alleged to have conveyed this possibility to his bookmaker, Martin Krugman, who then allegedly passed the idea to Burke. The intelligence included detailed layouts of the cargo building, employee schedules, and the vault's security mechanisms. On the night of the heist, a stolen Ford Econoline van carrying armed men, disguised with ski masks, arrived at the cargo building. The employees present were quickly overpowered and secured. Utilizing a key and inside knowledge, the robbers accessed the vault without triggering alarms, loading numerous cartons of untraceable currency into the van. 
The execution was flawless, with the entire operation concluding without immediate detection, as the robbers instructed employees to delay contacting the police, ensuring their escape. The aftermath saw a mix of paranoia and police investigation, leading to a series of unfortunate events. Despite intense efforts by law enforcement, including surveillance and analysis of known associates, the bulk of the stolen assets remained unrecovered. Further, most involved either vanished or met grim fates without ever being formally charged. The only conviction related to the heist was of Louis Werner, the inside man whose information made the robbery possible. Also, if any of this sounds familiar to you, it's likely because you've watched Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese's 1990 masterpiece. Stay tuned because the fate of two of the alleged participants will be discussed further in this episode. The Flatwoods Monster. The Flatwoods Monster has been a source of intrigue and mystery since its first reported sighting in 1952 in West Virginia. On the evening of September 12, 1952, a group of children playing in the small town of Flatwoods claim to have seen a bright object streak across the sky and crash on a nearby hill. Accompanied by a local adult, Kathleen May, and a National Guardsman, Gene Lemon, they went to investigate. What they reportedly encountered has since become the stuff of legend. A towering figure with a red face, glowing eyes, and a dark, metal-like appearance. This entity, later dubbed the Flatwoods Monster, was said to emit a pungent mist that caused irritation and sickness among the witnesses. Initial investigations by local police and subsequent inquiries found no conclusive evidence of the creature's existence. Despite this, the story gained national attention, with newspapers and radio broadcasts spreading the tale across the country. The Flatwoods Monster's description as a 10-foot-tall entity with a spade-like face and glowing eyes captivated the public's imagination. This initial encounter remains one of the most well-documented and widely discussed sightings in cryptid lore. Further sightings around the same time added to the mystery. Before the encounter in Flatwoods, a woman named Audra Harper and her friends reported seeing a ball of fire and a tall figure in the same area. Following the Flatwoods incident, a couple reported their car malfunctioning and encountering a similar monstrous figure which vanished after approaching them. These additional accounts contributed to the lore surrounding the Flatwoods monster, suggesting a series of related phenomena rather than an isolated incident. Skeptical explanations have posited that the sighting was a result of misidentification, possibly of a large barn owl, influenced by the heightened anxieties of Cold War America. The combination of a meteor, the silhouette of an owl, and the witnesses' state of fear might have contributed to the creation of the monster in their minds. In my view, the Flatwoods monster was a case of mass hysteria overlaid on top of an owl misidentification. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If people knew about the size and capabilities of owls, a large portion of cryptid sightings would be considered definitively solved. Anyway, in my view, the Flatwoods monster is definitely not a hoax, and the people who saw the creature genuinely believed they had seen a cryptid. The Slaying of Bell Star In the late 19th century, the tale of Bell Star, an American outlaw, captured the nation's imagination. Her infamy peaked when her life was cut short in a violent ambush in 1889, just days before her 41st birthday. Bell Star's life was marked by her association with notorious figures and her involvement in criminal activities, such as horse theft, for which she was once convicted and served time in Detroit. While Bell Star was a well-known figure in the United States prior to World War I, her fame has significantly waned over the years. Following the death of her husband, Sam Starr, in a gunfight, Bell continued her life of crime eventually marrying Jim July Starr, a younger man and a relative of Sam. 
The circumstances of Bell Star's demise remain shrouded in mystery. She was fatally ambushed while returning home from a neighbor's house, shot multiple times to ensure her demise. Theories about her attacker vary, with one account suggesting she was killed by Edgar J. Watson, a sharecropper who was later acquitted of the crime. Other suspicions have fallen on her family members and her new husband, all harboring potential motives for her killing. Despite various theories, the case remains unsolved, with no one ever definitively identified as the assailant. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel, asking a quick favor. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you all along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. The Slaying of Magdalena Stoffels In 2010, the tragic loss of a Namibian schoolgirl, Magdalena Stoffels, sent shockwaves through this African nation. On a July morning, the 17-year-old's life was abruptly ended near her school in Windhoek, Namibia, after a brutal assault. Despite immediate investigation efforts, the responsible party remains at large, leaving a community in mourning and a family seeking closure. The events following Stoffel's tragic passing ignited a nationwide debate on gender-based violence, bringing the issue to the forefront. An initial suspect, Junius Philippus, was named and charged with her slaying, with angry citizens calling for the reinstatement of the death penalty due to his alleged acts. However, forensic evidence collected eventually led to all charges being dropped in 2011 with Philippus being officially ruled out as a suspect. I was able to locate an article from a Namibian newspaper called New Era Live from November 2018. It was an extremely difficult read as it included an interview with Magdalena's mother. Her mother, out of religious conviction, has forgiven her daughter's killer, but has devoted her life to bringing the killer to justice. There still appears to be an active and open investigation into this case. However, unfortunately, I was not able to find where leads with respect to her case may be directed. Alaric's Lost Treasure The tale of Alaric's Lost Treasure is a legend that sprung out of the Visigothic king, Alaric's audacious sacking of Rome in 410 AD. This event, significant for its psychological impact on the Roman Empire, led to Alaric amassing vast wealth. The plunder has traditionally included two tons of gold, 13 tons of silver, alongside luxurious items like Chinese silks, high-end fleeces, and spices. In the aftermath of the sacking, Alaric's intentions to move his army to Sicily and then to Africa were cut short by his untimely death. Alaric's death in the same year shrouded his burial and the treasure's whereabouts in mystery. The intrigue around Alaric's final resting place is steeped in the dramatic narrative of his burial. According to historical accounts, Alaric was laid to rest in a tomb beneath the bed of the Bucento River with his treasure. In a move to keep the site a secret, the river's course was temporarily diverted the king and his riches interred, and then the waters were returned to their path, erasing any trace. To ensure the location remained a mystery, everyone who dug the grave was slain. Over centuries, the allure of Alaric's treasure has ignited the imaginations and ambitions of many, from 18th century explorers to Nazi leaders during the 20th century. Despite these efforts, Alaric's burial site and his treasure have remained elusive, cementing their status as one of history's great mysteries. The town of Cosenza, near the supposed burial site, has even undertaken official searches with the hope of uncovering this treasure, aiming to attract tourism and solve the ancient puzzle. While this treasure trove is deeply steeped in legend, in my view, it shouldn't be dismissed. 
The plausibility of Alaric's treasure being buried with him aligns with the practices of Germanic tribes, including the Visigoths. Germanic chieftains and kings were often buried along with their wealth to honor them in death. Further, this tradition was rooted in the strong belief that this wealth could serve him in the afterlife, and as such, it was not merely a custom, but a religious duty. This practice could be seen half a millennia later, where powerful and dreaded Vikings would include a significant portion of their worldly possessions in their graves. While nothing has ever been officially recovered from this lost treasure trove, like other lost treasures in this series, I don't think this should indicate it doesn't or didn't exist. After all, the fastest way to lose your newfound treasure is to tell everyone you've come into stunning riches suddenly. The Lost Florentine Diamond The Lost Florentine Diamond is a tale that captures the imagination, blending history with mystery. This gem, originating from India, boasts a light yellow hue with faint green overtones and weighs in at 137 carats. Known by various names including the Tuscan, the Tuscany Diamond, and the Austrian Yellow Diamond, its journey through history is as fascinating as its physical appearance. The diamond story begins with Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, who allegedly wore it into the Battle of Nancy in 1477, where upon his demise, a soldier found and sold it. This marked the beginning of its illustrious journey through the hands of various owners, including Ludovico Sforza, and eventually the Medici family, enriching the treasury of Florence. It was later recut in Florence, Italy, becoming a prized possession of the Medici and subsequently the Habsburg family, included in the Austrian crown jewels. However, the diamond's fate took a turn after World War I. With the fall of the Austrian Empire, it was reportedly taken into exile by Emperor Charles I of Austria. Rumors abound regarding its disappearance, suggesting it was stolen and possibly taken to South America or the United States, where it was recut and sold. Despite various theories, the exact whereabouts of the Florentine diamond remain unknown, leaving its story open to speculation. The slaying of Caesarian. The story of Caesarian, the last pharaoh of Ptolemaic Egypt, unfolds against a backdrop of political intrigue, power struggles, and the eventual consolidation of power by Rome over Egypt. Born in 47 BC and officially known as Ptolemy XV, though commonly known as Caesarian, was the son of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. His birth was a culmination of the strategic alliance between his mother, Cleopatra, aiming to solidify her power, and Julius Caesar, representing Rome's interests in Egypt. Despite his royal lineage, Caesarian's life was overshadowed by the tumultuous events that followed his father's assassination in 44 BC. Cleopatra's attempt to align with Rome through Caesar fell apart, and her subsequent liaison with Mark Antony did little to secure a stable future for her son. This alliance, however, led to the expansion of their dominion, but also set the stage for their downfall. In the wake of Mark Antony's defeat by Octavian, later Caesar Augustus, in 31 BC at the Battle of Actium, the political landscape shifted dramatically against Cleopatra and her son. In a desperate bid to save Caesarian, Cleopatra sent him away with plans to escape across the Red Sea. Some traditions hold that he was to be transported as far away as India by sea route. Following Cleopatra's demise, Caesarian returned to Egypt, possibly lured by promises of power from Octavian. This decision proved fatal, with tradition holding that Octavian eliminated this potential rival for control over Rome and Egypt. The motivations behind Caesarian's return to Egypt and consequently his tragic end, have been subject to speculation. Some sources suggest that he was lured back to Egypt by a promise by Octavian that he could rule as a client king of Rome in Egypt. However, it seems odd that he would have believed this, 
given that Octavian had either slain his mother or forced her to end herself. At any rate, he ought to have known his elimination cleared Octavian's path to undisputed power, marking the end of the Ptolemaic dynasty and the beginning of a new era under Roman rule. Perhaps one of his trusted advisors was compromised by Octavian and convinced him to come back. Another theory states that Octavian wished to end a potential rival for a claim to Julius Caesar's legacy, given that he was Julius Caesar's adoptive son. The exact circumstances of the demise of Caesarian remain unknown, and it is not entirely confirmed that he was slain on Octavian's orders. Saki Sanabashi Saki Sanabashi, also known by Go For A Punch, is an enigmatic piece of alleged lost media that has captivated the curiosity of internet users worldwide. Originating from a 2015 post on 4chan's paranormal board, an anonymous user shared their encounter with a disturbing anime. This anime purportedly depicted a group of girls trapped in a bathroom without any escape, leading to their dire ends. The author of the post stated the girls engaged in melancholic discussions prior to their endings. The post sparked widespread intrigue, prompting a fervent online search for the anime, despite its existence being unconfirmed and possibly fictional. In 2019, a Reddit user cleverly named Saki Sanobashi OP stated that they were behind the hoax and they had posted it as a joke. Given the anonymous nature of 4chan, no proof was provided by this Reddit poster and likely no proof could be provided. Despite this so-called confession, the search for this alleged piece of lost media continues till this day, though with much less intensity. I feel like this falls squarely within the realm of an urban legend rather than lost media. In my view, this stems from the initial source for the tale of Saki Sanobashi. The X board on 4chan is a hub for paranormal and supernatural discussions known for its unfiltered and often speculative content. It's not a board for discussing anime, though my research indicates that numerous such boards exist for this purpose on the website. Its nature, fostering anonymity and a lack of accountability, means that information shared can range from intriguing theories to outright fabrications without consequence. Further, it appears that the board's culture encourages the sharing of personal experiences, conspiracy theories, and unverified stories without the expectation of evidence or factual accuracy. The slayings of Robert McMahon and Joe Manry. The slayings of Robert McMahon and Joe Manry, allegedly in connection to the Lufthansa heist, remain, quote, unsolved till this day. The slayings underline the brutal aftermath and the lengths to which the alleged perpetrators went to silence those who could expose them. McMahon, serving as an Air France night shift supervisor at Kennedy Airport, had an intimate knowledge of the airport's operations. This allegedly made him invaluable to the planning and execution of the heist. Despite not directly participating in the theft, his alleged association and potential knowledge of the individuals involved marked him for elimination. Joe Manry was also allegedly a crucial figure in the planning of the Lufthansa heist. He allegedly leveraged his position as a night shift Air France cargo supervisor at JFK Airport to provide insider information. McMahon, along with Joe Manry, were found dead five months after the heist in a parked car each with a gunshot wound to the back of the head. This methodical execution style suggests a deliberate effort to eliminate potential risks of exposure or betrayal. Further, it suggests that there was no passion involved in these crimes. These slayings were the work of a professional. Interestingly, both McMahon and Manry had been offered entrance in the Witness Protection Program in exchange for giving evidence against their alleged co-conspirators. Unfortunately, I have a sneaking suspicion that their slayings will remain unsolved. The Nandi Bear. The Nandi Bear, a creature steeped in East African folklore 
particularly within the narratives of the Nandi people of Western Kenya, fascinates both locals and cryptozoologists alike. Known by various names in local languages, the Nandi bear is described as a formidable carnivore with a strong physical build. It's described as having high front shoulders towering over four feet, a sloping back, and the capacity to stand on its hind legs. Historical accounts and sightings have painted a vivid picture of this cryptid, suggesting a creature with dark, thick fur resembling the European brown bear. However, despite the name, its behaviors and physical attributes are much more akin to a powerful tree-climbing hyena. This cryptid's diet, according to legend, included the brains of its prey, further contributing to its terrifying reputation. The sightings of the Nandi bear span back to at least the 19th century, with notable encounters documented in the early 20th century. Despite these numerous accounts, the Nandi bear has eluded capture and definitive identification, leading to a variety of theories regarding its existence. Some speculate it to be a surviving example of an extinct creature, while more common scientific explanations are of the view that it is simply a hyena misidentification. The most recent documented sighting occurred in 1998, when a couple encountered a large, shaggy animal that resembled a hyena, but was significantly larger. Mass hysteria offers a plausible explanation for sightings of entities like the Nandi bear. This psychological phenomenon can occur when fear, rumors, or belief in an entity or presence spreads among a group, leading to widespread social contagion. In such cases, individuals may report seeing or experiencing phenomena that have no external basis in reality. The power of suggestion, fueled by folklore and reinforced by community endorsement, can cause people to genuinely perceive threats or entities that are not there. This perhaps explains why the Nandi bear was consistently seen in the late 19th century and early 20th century, at the height of its popularity. Further, it offers a sensible explanation as to why Nandi bear sightings have functionally run dry today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership, and the Discord. Links are in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Also, shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out.